some uh, responsive singing between the two uh, groups, between the, between the men and the women. So if you can do that, that would sound good. It's number 317 we're going to start with. Stand with me and we'll sing When I See the Blood, 317. Responsive thing? Okay. Christ the Redeemer died on the cross, died for the sinner, paid all his due. Sprinkle your soul with the blood of the Lamb, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Chiefest of sinners, Jesus will save all he has promised that he will do wash in the fountain open for sin and i will pass will pass over you when i see the blood when i see the blood when See the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Oh, great compassion, oh, boundless love, oh, loving kindness, faithful and true. Find peace and shelter under the blood, and I will pass, pass over you. When I, when I see the blood, see the blood, when I, when I see the blood, see the blood, when I, when I see the blood, see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Amen, Pastor. Amen. Good evening. Good to see you in church tonight. Good crowd out tonight. It's good to see Freddie back there again. Everybody turn around and say hola. Hi, Freddie. Hola. hola. <laughs> he, he knows, Brother James, he knows, Brother James, he knows very little English, okay? He's, uh, he works across the road here at the farm, and we're just so privileged to have Freddie here with us tonight. It's just a blessing. I, he just makes me smile. I don't know what it is. He's got such a big smile on his face. Uh, well, it's good to be back in the house of God, and uh, thank you for coming back tonight. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, it's good to be here. We love you and thank you, God, for providing such a uh, beautiful opportunity to get together with your people. Thank you, God, that in all of your plans and design that you designed a church for us. And God, you designed a place for us to fit right here in this body. And so, Lord, I, I am so pleased tonight, Lord, for each person that's here. And God, I ask that you would move in our hearts. I pray that you would challenge us tonight uh, according to the preaching of your word. And uh, Lord, I, I pray that you would cause our hearts to burn for missions. Uh, Lord, that we might see the great need. Now, Lord, I pray tonight that you once again would touch our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Number 296. 296. Continue the fine singing. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a Where I first saw the light And the burden of my heart rolled away It was there by faith 
I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I have done, he groaned upon the tree? Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glory. When Christ the mighty maker died For man the creature's sin At the cross, at the cross Where I first saw the light And the burden of my heart rolled away It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. But drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Dear Lord, I give myself away, tis all that I can. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. Um, got an announcement here that wasn't announced this morning. It's in the, or nor is it in the bulletin. Uh, Pastor Marvin Smith will be holding a spiritual warfare conference this week at Sheridan Road Baptist Church in Saginaw. If anyone is interested in carpooling on Tuesday evening, we'll be meeting at the church at 530. Please let Brother Kendall know if you would like to come along. We had Brother Smith here a year and a half ago or two years ago. And uh, he's my pastor, Brother Smith. We're going to try to get over there and see him. And uh, he's uh, just a very interesting ministry, uh, dynamic ministry. Appreciate him very much. And uh, how many of you were here when Brother Smith was here? You heard Brother Smith. It's just pretty amazing what he has to say about spiritual warfare. And so uh, meeting here at the church at 530 or if you just want to drive over and need directions for the church or anything like that, just see Brother Kendall and he'll help you out with that. As far as our announcements go, our regular announcements, um, there is uh, Ladies Bible Study on Tuesday and Bearing Precious Seed uh, on Tuesday as well. Bible Study at 10, Ladies, uh, I mean, uh, ladies at 10 and the uh, Bearing Precious Seed at 1. And let's see here, Not Ashamed Street Preaching Ministry at 5 o'clock on Friday, and that's going to be down at the Right Aid Corner in Lapeer, and uh, we're going to have a few more weeks of that. If you want to get involved, get in, right? Uh, that uh, the time change really throws a curveball to the street preaching. It gets dark so early. And then uh, this is something to pay attention to, our men's prayer breakfast. Guys, I hope that you'll come out for our men's prayer breakfast at 8.30 on Saturday morning. Come for a special time together of prayer, of food, fellowship, time in the Word of God, just, uh, uh, just all around a good time together. Very important for our church. And then October 7th, I, I didn't really emphasize this like I should have this morning. There are sign-up sheets in the back for this. Uh, we're going to have a fall fellowship here at the church at 5 o'clock next, not next Saturday, the week after that, two Saturdays from now with horseshoes and cornhole and a hayride and cider and apple dessert contest, chili cook-off. Sign up on the bulletin board in the lobby for the games, uh, for uh, a contest 
or to judge or to bring food. Uh, immediately, Connor went right back there and he said he is going to judge in the dessert category. <laughs> and he signed up for that. So uh, just come on out. Just have a time of fellowship. Uh, you don't want to play games, don't play games, whatever you want to do, but uh, come on out and just enjoy the, the fellowship together. All right, ushers, why don't you come for our offering at this time? Appreciate your faithfulness and your giving. We serve a faithful God, uh, and he takes care of us. We're going to be talking a little bit about that tonight in our business meeting. We have some things that we need to discuss, but uh, so thankful that we serve a God who is faithful. Let's return that in like kind to him. Brother Ron, won't you pray for us, please? Amen. Let's sing again. Stand with me and turn to 309. 309. Just 
blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be safe to sin no faith I saw the stream thy flowing wounds supply redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die and shall be till I die and shall Brother David is coming up now to sing for us. I kind of suspected that. We can go ahead and start right in. Oh, you got something for us, David? That's okay, David. If you're not ready, that's fine. Ah, you got something. You're just doing that to me again, aren't you, brother? Good job, David. Well, I'm going to say, well, I can say glory to his name. Yeah. I know, wonderful to say glory. So glory to his name I'm going to be. good when you carry that in your pocket. Praise the Lord. They just love him at the nursing home. Absolutely just love that. And we do too. Amen. All right, I'm going to have Brother Huckabee come, and you can uh, just take uh, take the time that you need, Brother Huckabee. And uh, I, do we get the video worked out? 
Okay. Do you want to do that right away? Should I pull this down? Excuse me? Okay. Let's do it. You all want to see if I can reach. I know that. <laughs> Unless I shrunk, I can. Ah. Yes, I can. I get it. My wife, Anna, and I answered the call of God in 2005 to begin the long and sometimes arduous process of going to Uganda as missionaries. Our church, Grace Baptist Church in St. Louis, Missouri, commissioned us and sent us out to be their representatives in a foreign land, far from home. We gathered ourselves and, at the time, our five children, and set forth on the adventure that eventually allowed us to gather our possessions and journey to another continent, to Africa, to Uganda. Uganda has been our home since 2010. Our children grew up there. Our youngest child was born there. We have built a life there in Mbarara, our own bright, warm city on a mountain in southwestern Uganda. We remain with our African child, Brenna, and continue to do the work God called us to, and will do so until Jesus returns or God gives us permission to leave. It is our great privilege and pleasure to serve our Savior Jesus Christ, seeking to bring the gospel to the people he loved so very much and gave his life to save. Our oldest children are attending college in America. They are all still serving God. They look back on their time here with love and affection and miss their home in the sun greatly. God has used their time here to turn them into the compassionate, godly, motivated young men and women they are today. Currently, I pastor four churches in the UNHCR refugee camp at Nachabale. These are the Independent Baptist Churches of Ngarama, Isanja, Sangano, and Kabazana. I have endeavored to train mature disciples of Christ and produce qualified leadership to manage our churches. Anna has been in charge of our large and ever-growing children's ministries, heading up our Sunday school classes, training teachers, and conducting our annual marathon vacation Bible schools, so-called because for three straight days, we do four separate BBSs at each church, one after the other, an hour at a time. God has blessed our labors, and our ministry has borne much fruit, with hundreds saved and baptized over the years. We can see the hand of God on this work, because even though the COVID lockdowns kept us out of Uganda for two years, our men continued the works meeting house to house in spite of the church closings that lasted almost the entire time across Uganda. And when I returned at the end of 2021, there were 65 people needing baptism and baptized them I did. It took over an hour. Our goal is to continue training and teaching and to someday produce enough qualified leaders to be able to hand the churches over to faithful men and then start more churches elsewhere. Would you prayerfully consider giving monthly in a financial partnership with this ministry? With your added financial support, we would be able to further expand the work God has led us to do. Or, perhaps would you prayerfully consider a one-time gift to support some of the shared needs of the four churches in the Nachavali refugee camp? To find out more, visit our website and click the link labeled Outstanding Projects. For those who have supported us all these years, the hundreds saved, baptized, and discipled, the numerous souls delivered from false religions and pagan cults, are fruit credited to your account. Your generosity and prayers made it possible to go, and more importantly, to stay. Thank you for your investment in our lives, and most of all, in the people of Uganda. God bless and keep you.
You can follow our exploits and the work God is doing through our ministry at our website, missionuganda.com, or on our Rumble channel. <laughs> well, at least it doesn't flip up there like they do in the Bugs Bunny cartoons, right? <laughs> well, I'm glad you guys got to see that, and uh, it's uh, good to be back. I uh, hope everybody had a restful afternoon. I did. I had your basic Baptist nap so that you can be uh, uh, invigorated and recharged for the evening service and ready to go. So uh, um, just... Uh, uh, do check into the website from time to time, and uh, and then Rumble, uh, which has all my all my videos in there, because uh, we've had some interesting adventures. And anytime something new or uh, or fun happens, we try to put it up on the internet. And uh, I'm trying to gradually build up a body of uh, uh, videos that just show different aspects of life in uh, in Uganda, because you know people are curious, and it's uh, it's hard to describe it. It's just better to to show you, and so that's uh, that's why we have that in there. But uh, thank you for lunch. Uh, I feel like uh, country fried steak is good about any time of the night or day. Uh, so that, uh, that worked out good. And uh, we appreciated the fellowship around the table. And uh, just uh, thank you for being a blessing and an encouragement and a, and a support to us. All right, let's uh, turn over to Psalms, uh, chapter 139. And uh, I'm going to dig around and get my notes here. Otherwise, I'll have to do something, uh, the technical term is winging it, but uh, it's better to have notes, and you don't wander too much. All right, Psalms 139, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 16, and uh, <clears throat> this is a psalm of David, and he writes, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me, thou knowest my down sitting and mine uprising, thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and I pray God give me the wisdom to preach it with clarity and power and authority, and uh, uh, help us to hear from you tonight, and uh, to be obedient, uh, and to be encouraged, uh, as your word is there to encourage us. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, <clears throat> here we have what the rabbis of the Jewish religion have generally considered to be the greatest of David's psalms. Uh, David, uh, as we heard about this morning, was a warrior poet. Uh, he was as skilled with the harp and the song as he was with the sword. Uh, he was a complicated man, uh, not a perfect man. Uh, certainly had his uh, share of, uh, well, mistakes and even sin uh, throughout his life. But God persisted in thinking of David as the apple of his eye, and a man after his own heart. Um, he has written some of the most beautiful songs uh, that are preserved for us in the Bible. And uh, it's always been an encouragement to me uh, because you see David 
questioning his lot in life and being upset and being bothered by what's happening to them. And yet he always finishes with praise for God. And I think that's healthy. Uh, You don't want to bottle up how things are making you feel or lie to yourself as though the things that are happening to you haven't happened. You have to acknowledge them, you have to face them, and then you take them to the feet of the cross. And that's, that's about the only thing you can do uh, in situations like that. And so uh, the Psalms are there uh, as an encouragement to, to God's people. Uh, it's the hymn book of the Old Testament. It's, it's, these are the songs that Jesus would sing uh, at times when they would meet for various feasts in the Jewish, Jewish calendar. And so it's uh, exceedingly significant. Uh, and I particularly like this psalm because it speaks so much to this concept of, uh, of identity, uh, identity, uh, this effort to try to answer the question, who am I? Who am I? And what does that mean? Uh, how you identify yourself and uh, uh, define yourself determines how you live your life. You know, so if you see yourself as a loser, you're going to act like a loser. If you see yourself as a, as a monster, you'll be a monster. But if you carry yourself with dignity and authority as a son or a daughter of the Almighty, uh, if you see yourself as a servant of the Most High, uh, it'll change the way you live your life. And so it's very, very important that you try to understand who you are. And so with that, we have this psalm. And basically, you know, the sermon title is very simple. Uh, it's just God knows us. God knows us. Uh, have you ever wondered, um, is there anybody who understands me? Or have you ever felt like nobody gets me? Um, have you ever cast your eyes upon yourself and, 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 and wondered, is, is there anybody who understands? And all that is, when we ask these questions, is we're expressing the loneliness that most human beings feel. Uh, we are creatures by virtue of our creation and the fall of man, we are uh, separated from God, uh, cut off from heaven, Um, and when we come back by faith in Jesus Christ and and come to know God again as we should, um, we're still separated from him by the distance of time and space, and the the day is coming when we're going to go to him and see him face to face. But we live with that loneliness all of our life. We weren't made for this world. Uh, We pass through it temporarily, but it's not our permanent home. And the world that we belong to calls to us all of our life. And so when people cast about uh, in their ignorance and in the darkness of their mind, trying to find a purpose in life, that's what they're looking for. They just don't know it. And so the great benefit of being a follower of Christ is is understanding finally that, that God knows us. He knows us. He gets us, he understands us, and he likes us anyway. So David bases this assertion on two things, all right? And you can see it in the two parts of this passage. Uh, First of all, God is everywhere and therefore knows everything. Uh, In fancy uh, theological terminology, uh, those are attributes of God. Uh, The first one is omnipresence. It just means God is everywhere. Um, So he's, any place you go, God is already there. All right, so if if you're running from God, you're really running towards God. Uh, That's the uh, way it is when you're everywhere. Um, And then omniscience, God knows everything. He knows all the details of everything. Uh, He knows all your thoughts. He knows the thoughts you haven't even thought yet. Uh, So, you know, put that in your uh, pipe and smoke it. So, Uh, Therefore, God knows us. Uh, God made us, uh, point two, and therefore he knows us. uh, Because he made us, he knows everything about us. Um, My son had a Toyota Camry until a careless driver murdered it (laughs) uh, on one of his drives uh, uh, back from Alabama. And because he had taken it apart and put it together so many times, uh, he knows exactly how a Toyota Camry is supposed to gather and how every part is supposed to work. Well... God's that way towards us. He made us, and so therefore he knows us. All right, so <clears throat> verse 1 starts off, and it says, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. So God knows us because he has searched us. Uh, he's made a diligent study of us. 
Uh, he knows every detail uh, as a consequence. Well, what does he know? Uh, what did he learn from his study? Well, David gives us a short list. Uh, verse 2, he says we, he knows our sitting down uh, and, uh, and our rising up. So he knows all our thoughts, everything we think. Uh, so be very careful what you think about. God, God can hear your thoughts. Uh, it's one of the ways we could identify that Jesus was indeed the Son of God because on more than one occasion, the Bible says, and he knew their thoughts. Um, angels and demons cannot hear your mind. Uh, they can observe your behavior and make inferences based on it, but they can't hear your thoughts. God can hear your thoughts. He was with you in your mother's womb from the moment of conception, and he's been with you every step of the way. So he knows your mind uh, very, very well. Uh, it says in verse 3 that he compasses our path. Um, because God is everywhere, he's with us everywhere we go. So e everywhere you are, God's there. Uh, when we went to the mission field, we were going there to join God in a work he'd already started. <laughs> so we weren't beginning anything. We were just joining him in what he had already started, and we get to participate in it for a little while. Uh, so he is with us everywhere we go. Uh, you can't go any place, but God is already there. Uh, it's why in the Garden of Eden, you know, you read in the book of Genesis that you know, they tried to hide themselves from God. Uh, and it's laughable. You can't hide from God. Uh, you can't run away from him. You know, Jonah thought he could put an ocean between him and God and it would be enough. But, you know, anywhere you go, God's already there. So the best thing to do is just quit running, humble yourself, repent, and, you know, go home. <laughs> go back to God and, and, and stop this foolishness of thinking you can hide from him or run away. Uh, it, it talks about in verse 3 how he, uh, he, he watches our lying down. So he watches over us when we sleep. Um, if you're a parent, um, you know how uh, you'll, you'll have that, that panic moment. It, it happens to every parent at least once uh, in your, your tenure uh, being responsible for these little human beings. But there's that fear, what if they go to sleep and they don't wake up, right? <laughs> so the night will come when they're exceptionally quiet. And if you have active children, which I always have, quiet is bad, all right? It usually means they're starting something on fire, or they're mixing things that shouldn't be mixed. Um, so quiet means you gotta go, you gotta start running, you know, because something's bad. So if it gets quiet in the house, you're like, what's wrong? <laughs> and I'll, I'll never forget it. Um, my eldest daughter, Elizabeth, uh, she, she did her best to try to kill us off with sleep deprivation. Like she wanted to see how much sleep a human could go without before they just cracked up and died. And uh, so, you know, we were desperate. We tried everything um, short of drugging her, I guess. Uh, and, and, and Anna was uh, sleeping the sleep of the exhausted and can't be awake no more. So I staggered in there and, you know, she's crying and I'm trying to think of what to do, you know, young father. And so I thought, well, you know, say you're not supposed to put them on their stomach, you know, because, you know, the, the, the mattress will rise up and smother them instantly, you know. Um, and, uh, so I'm just going to try it, just to see, you know, if she starts to turn blue, I'm here to stop it, you know, so just as an experiment, I'm going to try it. So I stretched her out over my lap on her stomach, and boom, she was out like a light. I couldn't believe it. It was like magic. <laughs> so, you know, you got to carefully get them up, you know, and just, just get them in the bed real careful, because you don't want to wake them up. And then I snuck back into our room and went to, went, went to bed, and she was bolt upright like a two hours, like, <gasps> she's dead! <laughs> and so... She, we snuck in there, and I'm like, no, no, I just laid her on her stomach. She's like, you can't lay them on their stomach. I'm like, she's fine, she's fine. I'm like, let's just sneak in there and see. And, and we stood there and watched her breathing until we could make sure that everything is cool. And so we, that's how we found out that Elizabeth is a stomach sleeper. She needs to be on her stomach, or she just won't sleep. But God watches over you when you sleep, you know, like, like you do your own children, you know. Um, it's... If, you, if you've had kids, you know that's the only time they're still. <laughs> and they're so peaceful uh, when they're like that. And there's, there's, it, it's kind of beautiful in a way. And you just stand there and you just watch them sometimes. Not in a creepy kind of a way, uh, but just because it, you just marvel at this little bitty life that, uh, that God is, has given you. And so God, that's how God feels towards us. He watches us while we sleep. And uh, that, that, that makes me feel secure, you know. And, and little children... They feel better when they know that, you know, mom and dad are in the house and if anything,
tries to get them. You know, grizzly bear comes ripping through the wall or monsters under the bed or anything like that. You know, that, that dad's right up the hall and he'll come charging in and do his, do his level best to kill it with extreme prejudice. So um, they sleep better, just knowing that somebody's watching them while they sleep. So that's how God is towards us. He watches uh, our lying down. Uh, then it says there's not a word in our mouth, uh, but God knows all about it. So he not only knows everything he thinks, he hears everything we say. Uh, that's, uh, that ought to be food for thought. <laughs> be careful what you say. Um, but he listens to everything we talk about. Uh, so he's not only hearing our thoughts, he's listening to our words too. It's kind of like how even though the things that children say are simplistic or even silly at times, uh, you listen to everything your kids have to say because it's always important to you. Uh, you hang on their every word. And I recommend you do that because they're going to reach an age where they won't be able to talk like that anymore. You know, they're going to get advanced in their speech and they won't make those cute little mistakes in English anymore uh, when they're learning the language. Uh, but God thinks everything we have to say is important. And so he listens to us. And that's how God treats us. He knows all of our words altogether. Uh, verse 5 says he has beset us behind and before. And what that means is he makes us secure, safe. It's like he's fenced us about. Um, he's guard, and he's guarding the fence. Um, when, where we live in Uganda, uh, uh, they build their homes uh, inside walled compounds. So I have a 10-foot wall around my property with, uh, with concertino wire, and I have a two 120-pound two, you know, dogs that patrol my compound at night. Uh, we're about as secure as it's possible for a human being to be. Uh, we're not allowed to have guns, um, but I've learned that a 120-pound dog, if he's well-trained, is almost as good as a gun, you know. And, uh, you know, it, 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 you know it, it runs at you, and it's trying to bite you, and it's on a level where it'll bite you in places you'd rather not be bit. And so uh, um, a good dog uh, will give just about any, any intruder pause. <laughs> And like I, like I like to say, uh, the purpose of the walls is not to keep them out. It's to trap them inside once they're in. <laughs> so once they're in, you know, get ready to meet Jesus, you know, because uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a done deal. You know? And so those, those dogs, they love us, but they, uh, they really don't like uh, intruders at all. That's, that's just how they were bred and, and how they were trained. Uh, but our youngest son, Galen, my eldest, James, the one that just got married, uh, has a fondness for ghost stories. Uh, you, you ever had a kid like that in your house that likes to tell scary stories and make the younger ones not sleep at night, you know? And, you know, he's operating counter to your purposes because, remember, your goal as a parent is you want them to sleep because then you can sleep. And you're like, son, you've got to see, quit telling these kids ghost stories. And he's standing over there smirking with that look on his face like he's trying not to laugh because he doesn't want to get in trouble, but he knows he's up to no good. He gets that same look on his face now. That's how we know he's up to mischief because <laughs> he gets that look on his face. But he would, our son Galen, for some reason, was deathly afraid of bears. And we tried to tell him, son, there are no bears in Africa anywhere. And, but he was so scared of them. And James was telling him, oh, you know, Galen, once a bear gets your smell, he never stops hunting you. And he will hunt you for the rest of his life. And bears can swim. And they will swim across the ocean and hike all the way over here and get you. <laughs> and so he's terrified. I'm like, boy, look, look at our house. Look at this wall. Look at the bars on the windows. You know, we, we locked this thing up at night. We got two big dogs in this yard. And even if they get past the dogs, I got this spear I keep by my bed. There are no bears going to get you. <laughs> so we always taught them, uh, not, if, if you're scared and you're having trouble sleeping at night, uh, you can pray and ask God to help you and protect you. So uh, that's the way it is for us. You know, God makes us secure he he protects us uh and and we don't have to we don't have to live in fear now it doesn't mean you can be careless or foolish <laughs> but uh you need to exercise some wisdom 
but uh, God is looking out for you. And uh, I am confident that we're going to get to heaven and be amazed at all the times we should have died and he saved our life uh, in one way or another and we didn't know anything about it because it was just kind of like one of those whew, you know, quick parent moves where a child's about to run out in the road and you save them at the last second. You know, it happens all the time. Um, so, you know, because kids are quick, right? <laughs> so uh, that's how God does with us. He compasses us, he, he besets us on all sides uh, so we can be safe. And then uh, it says he lays his hand upon us. Um, when, when a child is starting to get out of line and, they're do, and, and, you, and you can't really haul off and smack them in public because people get uptight about that. So what you do is you just put that hand on them, right? And they're like, <clears throat> and they know, you know, don't do that. You know, or as my children like to call it, the whisper of death, right? Or you just lean in real close. Boy, you better stop that right now because you know what you're going to get, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and, that, and it's usually all you have to do. They just straighten up and fly right. And the last thing they want is for you to take them out to the car because at the car, there are no witnesses. <laughs> so, uh, and, and your, your goal as a parent is to work yourself out of a job. You want to train them up to the point where you don't really need to you know, spank them or correct them anymore. So if you're diligent about it, uh, they eventually learn to control their own behavior. And then they grow up and then they have their own kids. And then you can just sit back you know, when their children do to them what they once did to you, and then, then you can laugh, uh, you know, in satisfaction as a grandparent, like, see there, <laughs> that's what you used to do. My dad's done it many, many times. Galen was my clone, pretty much. Uh, he, he pretty much did it. I got paid back for everything I ever did to my poor mother, uh, and, you know, climbing fences and running down the road and taking off and you know, climbing anything I could get my fingers into, uh, that's, that's, that's how I was, and he did us the same way. But many is the time I had to lay my hand on them just to stop them so they wouldn't do, do something and get themselves killed. Um, but uh, it was particularly bad. Uh, one, of the, one of our trips to the Grand Canyon, um, uh, one of the benefits of being, or fringe benefits of being a missionary is you travel a lot. And so we just always try to go to national parks because they're usually free or almost free. And, uh, you know, it's your birthright as an American, so why not, you know? And they're, they're all over the place. So uh, we made a special point of going to the Grand Canyon because it's, uh, it's a modern, you know, it's a, it's a natural wonder. It's, it's, it, there's nothing quite like it in the whole world. Uh, and people come from all over the world to see it because it's, uh, it's remarkable. But, you know, the, the boys kept running. And, you know, there's, hundred, you know, there's cliffs that if you fall off them, there's not really much left of you to bury at that point. You know, there's just a greasy spot somewhere in the distance down, down at the bottom. And they kept running at it. And, and Anna is, is, you know, she's, had, she's approaching the point of having a psychotic break. You know, so she's just, because there's three of them. And they outnumber her three to one. And they're going in three separate directions. And she can't chase them three different ways. You know, the, the human body just won't do that. And, and so it came time for me to dad. And uh, sometimes fathers just have to, we don't parent like mothers, <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know if you guys ever did this, but uh, you know they were in their Oshkosh overalls phase. You know those, uh, and uh, uh, and they're cute as cute as butt when they're in that 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 zone. But you know, coveralls work like luggage handles. You know, you, you just grab on the back and lift, and you can swing them. You know, they love it. It's, it's the coolest thing in the world. You know, and uh, many of the time I had to snatch them by the coveralls and yank them back. So. I said, all right, boys, come with me. You guys want to see what's over the edge of that fence? Let's go, let, let's go, set, let's go satisfy your curiosity. So we went right up to the edge. I walked them over, and I leaned them out, and I said, you see how far down that is? Yeah, Dad. What do you think is going to happen if you fall down there? I'll die? Yes, you'll die. You're going to hit every rock on the way down, and you'll be a bloody mess at the bottom. You going to run at that cliff anymore? No, Dad, no. Okay. And then we backed away. So sometimes... You have to find ways to design ways for them to take some risks and not die. And, 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 I th and, and you just got to lay that hand on them uh, to keep them alive. And I, I think God does that with us. He will allow us to experience some things, to teach us some things, but he tries to keep us safe too. Uh, so uh, a certain amount of risk taking is healthy. You don't have to be reckless and you don't have to be foolish, but you know, Kids just want to try stuff, and they're curious, and so it's best just to go ahead and satisfy their curiosity, do it in a controlled setting. Um, if eye protection is needed, use it. Um, 
and just let them find out what happens. And then, you know, they don't have to burn the house down. They don't have to blow themselves up. They don't have to tumble off a cliff. They don't have to go out in the traffic and get hit by a car. Um, they can satisfy their curiosity and not be killed. So uh, God does that. He'll just put his hand on us. But you see, when God's got his hand on you, nobody can hurt you, right? Nobody can get you. <laughs> nobody can come after you. You know, when your dad's with you, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll mouth off to the bigger kids because you know, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> My dad's right here. <laughs> so I, I, I love that. God has his hand on us. Uh, it literally means exactly what it says. God is protecting us, and he's trying to keep us safe, trying to steer the course of our life and uh, make us into the kind of people he wants us to be. So you look at all these things, all the ways that God is involved in our life, and, and what is David's reaction to all of this? Well, he says in verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too high. It's too high. We simply cannot comprehend the full magnitude of God's care for us, his intense interest in us, and his love for us. Um, you know, God's love, we, we, we can barely understand it. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're like a paramecium swimming in water compared to the greatness and the magnitude of God. You know, we're like that little ant crawling along the ground, and yet, you know, as small as we are and as seemingly insignificant as our lives might be and as short as our lifespans are, God is intensely interested in each and every one of us. He cares about you. You know, he, he went to the cross and died to purchase your salvation so that you could have fellowship with him, so you could dwell with him forever in heaven. And that is, that is, that is really the central message of the gospel. It's going out into the world full of fallen, dark, damaged, lonely, desperate people and saving as many as we can. Pulling them back over to our side and saying, hey, have you met my Savior? Can I introduce you to Jesus? He'll change your life if you let him. And he'll never give you up. He'll never surrender you. He'll never walk away or forsake you. He'll make you his forever. So, it is knowledge that is too wonderful. And then, in verses 7 through 10, he tries to consider all the places you could possibly go to get away from God. And like I said before, no matter where you go, God is already there. So, he says, where can I go to get away from your spirit? Whither shall I flee? from your presence. And Hebrew language, it, it, it's full of rhetorical questions. There are questions that the answer is already known or it's obvious. And the answer is, of course, nowhere. Nowhere. There's nowhere you can go to flee from God's presence. He says, if you ascend up into heaven, he's already there. If you were able to go down into hell and sleep there, uh, uh, I've slept in some terrible hotels, but I, I can't claim I've ever made my bed in hell. <laughs> but that's what it says. So if you go to hell, he's already there. Uh, if you take the wings of the morning and you, you go to the uttermost depths of the sea, we know less about the depths of our ocean than we do our own solar system. And I, I, I don't want to you know, go to conspiracy theories that there's UFOs down there, but if there were, how would we know? <laughs> the Marianas Trench is two miles deep. It's a crack in the Earth's crust. And the pressure down there is so intense that nothing from higher up can live there. You'll be crushed. But there's live things down there. There's giant squids down there. We know there are because they come up to the, the, the shallow parts from time to time. Or we see the scars on things that they've tried to kill. <laughs> There could be anything down there, but we have no way to go down there. Uh, I'm sure you heard about the uh, billionaire explorer that uh, made that submersible, and it got crushed like a beer can, didn't it? Uh, that's what happens when you go too deep. Uh, but God is even at the deepest parts of the ocean. There, there's nowhere you can go to get away from him. Uh, it says, uh, actually, I'm probably getting ahead of myself here. Uh, I think... 
Paul must have had this psalm in mind when he wrote in Romans 8, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So he must have been thinking of this passage. And it is immensely comfortable to know uh, that God is everywhere and there's no place I can go, that he is not with me and knows what's happening to me and has a hand in it. So, you know, people who've been put in prison, people who have been put in terrible danger, uh, uh, soldiers serving behind the lines and putting their lives in jeopardy, um, people that have traveled to far off lands uh, as missionaries, you know, everywhere you go, uh, God is with you. No matter what danger you face, God is with you. And, and you can comfort yourself in the knowledge that he is with you. And even if you die, you know, you, when you open your eyes in heaven, his is the first sight you see. So it's an immensely comforting psalm. And that is, of course, its purpose. Verse 10 says, uh, Even there shall my hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If God has you by the hand, what can hurt you? You know, and, and when you have little children, you have to get them by the hand. If they're being ornery, you have to get them by the forearm, right? Because then they can't yank that hand through and get away. Uh, whenever we would travel internationally, of course, I've got all these beautiful blonde-headed kids, and I'm thinking all the time, human trafficking. <laughs> so I'm watching them all the time, like eagle eye. And everybody's got to hold somebody's hand, right? So nobody's allowed to wander, no going off any place by yourself. Uh, and because I'm, I'm, I'm worried to death as a father that somebody's going to snatch one of them and take off with them. You know, they're, they're bigger now and they could fight back. But when they're small, you know, somebody could just grab them. So you just hold their hand. Uh, if you're walking in a crowd, you've got them by the hand. If you're, if you're next to a busy road, you've got them by the hand. And as long as you've got them by the hand, you know where they are. And they're totally safe. Nothing's going to get them because you can you can whip them around behind. You know you can step in front, and there's a lot of things you can do if you if you've got them by the hand. Well, God's got you by your hand. He's holding your hand, and and you don't have to you don't have to worry. You can be safe. Uh, verse eleven says it's talking about darkness. Uh, he says, "Surely the darkness will cover me. Even the night, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness." hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day, and the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Uh, we had a saying when our kids were little and they were scared of the dark that there is nothing in the dark that wasn't already there in the light. Uh, so if you, know, you look around the room and there's no goblins under the bed, there's no monsters in the closet, you look around in the light, they don't pop into existence the, the minute you flip that light switch and it gets dark. So if it wasn't there in the light, it's not there in the dark either. Um, but as the passage here says, uh, God is in the dark too. And he's not blinded by it. He says the darkness is the same as daylight to him. He can see just fine. <laughs> so darkness, darkness is not a problem for God. It's the same as day to him. You know, darkness blinds us. You know, we're in the dark uh, I like to carry a, a flashlight with me everywhere I go. I've usually got at least one of them around. You know, like right now I've got my phone because uh, I can't really load up my belt with my full utility belt set up uh, when I'm wearing a suit. It just doesn't, doesn't work well. Uh, but, you know, the rest of the time I've got my, you know, I've got my, uh, my gun, my knife. Uh, I usually carry a, an extra magazine over in this pocket, and then I've got my, my, my Leatherman, because don't leave home without your Leatherman. It's nice to have a pair of needle nose pliers when you really need one, and then I've got my flashlight right here. So when you, know, you get into a situation where you can need more light, which is like you know, constantly, <laughs> you've got an extra flashlight, and then I've got like my emergency backup flashlight that I carry in my bag. See, we, we live in Uganda where the power can just go off at any time. And so we've got flashlights hit all over the place because, you know, you never know when the lights are going to go out. Uh, of course, now we've got a generator and batteries and stuff. But in our early days on the field, when we didn't have any of those conveniences, uh, you know, you just always had to have a flashlight handy. Uh, I've got some of those magnet flashlights that you just stick on the fridge, you know. Uh, so when the lights go out, you can feel your way in there and pop a light on and, uh, and you're good to go. 
Uh, so human beings, you know, we're, we're limited by the limitations of our eyes, right? Our eyes need light to be able to see. But God is God. He doesn't have eyeballs. <laughs> he can see just fine. He can see everything all the same every place. He can see the whole universe at once uh, and understand all of it simultaneously. So if you're a child and you're scared of the dark, don't be. Don't be. Now, if you think there is legitimately some kind of danger in the dark, go get your dad, and he'll come in, hopefully with a loaded weapon, and execute whatever it is, all right? So if you think somebody's breaking in, go get some help. Uh, you know, I told my kids, if you're worried, if you're worried, come get me, and, and we'll deal with whatever it is. And most of the time, it's just, all right, let's flip on the light, let's look around, let's look under the bed, see nothing's there. And, and then you just learn that, you know, you, you don't have to fear the dark, although it is wise to keep a good flashlight handy just, uh, just in case. But God is even in the dark, and the darkness and the light are, a same, are the same to him. So even in dark places, God is still with you, and you don't have to fear. God knows us because he is everywhere with us all the time. All the time. And, and, and I love that I can speak and God hear, hears me. I can think it and he hears me. And then for those times where you can't even think what to say or think the Holy Spirit is there to give utterance to your groaning. So one way or another, you're never away from God and his, his understanding of you. Now, verse 14, uh, he starts moving into design. Um, I will praise thee. Uh, no, he says in verse 13, for thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Um, if you've had any experience with horses, you know about reins. Uh, you've got a, a, a bit in the mouth, and then the, the, the reins are connected to that. And, you know, you're not, you know, yanking on it, because that's, that's not good horsemanship. But normally, a trained horse, you just have to lay the reins on its neck to one side or the other, and then you can steer that horse, you know, wherever you want the horse to go. He's been trained all of his life. When he feels that slight pressure, he knows to turn this way or to turn that way, uh, because he's been trained by a, a skilled horseman. Well, God is holding the reins of your life, all right? He is steering the course of your path. You know, he, he sets you on a, to a particular purpose, and he orchestrates everything that happens to you to help you reach whatever goal he has chosen for you. I can look back over the course of my life and see how God steered the course of my life every step of the way. Uh, Proverbs 16, verse 9 says, A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord direct his, directeth his steps. So God organizes reality in such a way that his will is accomplished, and we find our way to faith in Jesus Christ. And he does this without violating our free will. So God remains sovereign, and we remain accountable for our choices. God holds the reins. Uh, I am here as a missionary because long ago, uh, long before I was born, before my father ever met my mother, uh, you know, my, my dad is the, the, he's the son of hillbillies. <laughs> uh, he grew up in, 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 you know, East Tennessee and, uh, uh, you know, one of those kind of country boys that grew up with a rifle in his hand, hunting squirrels in the woods, you know, barefoot, dirt poor, you know, using an outhouse. Uh, my grandmother had an outhouse till the day she died, uh, and that's just the way it was. Um, and my uncles were moonshiners. Uh, they, like, literally brewed hooch up in the woods <laughs> and then smuggled it into Memphis to sell, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's how poor people made money uh, back then was by selling uh, uh, illegal alcohol that was so strong you could burn the warts off a mule with it, right? I mean, it was... It was basically just engine cleaner or paint thinner, you know. It, it was good for both, and, and uh, that's what they did. And an evangelist came to town and had a revival meeting, and my dad got saved. And it changed the whole course of his life. <laughs> uh, he went off and joined the Navy and served them uh, uh, for decades with distinction and uh, uh, retired in E9, I think, if I remember right. Uh, he was the first one uh, in his family that ever graduated college, uh, went off to seminary, got his master's degree, became a, became a pastor. He, he was an electrician that worked for McDonnell Douglas for years and years before uh, he, it, it got 
snapped up by Boeing. Um, met my mother uh, when he was a young man, and they went off to Spain together uh, on the, the government's uh, uh, dime, and, uh, and they adopted me. Uh, you know, uh, my mother had me out of wedlock, and I'm, I am the other side of the abortion equation. I'm what happens when you don't kill your baby uh, and you let it live. And I was delivered into the hands of Christian parents. You know, I actually eventually, when I was much older, tracked down uh, my mother and where she came from. It turns out I'm a Texan by blood. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I grew up in the Midwest and uh, spent some time in Louisiana. But, uh, you know, I would have grown up as liberal as the day is long. I, I would have got into who knows what kind of wicked philosophy. But I, I grew up in a Christian home because uh, there was a man and a woman somewhere and my mom couldn't have kids and they wanted a child and God gave them me. And none of that would have been possible if an evangelist hadn't answered the call of God and went to my dad's town in Selmer and preached a gospel message and he got saved. And it just started ripples in time. <laughs> that began setting off one chain of events after another that ultimately led to me going, answering the call to preach and going off to college to get that training and then met my wife and uh, you know, worked as a paramedic and, a, and a, a computer guy for a while and then got called to missions. And then we wind up uh, raising our support and it took years and then we went off to the mission field and raised our kids there and everything that has come to pass, you, know, you can see God orchestrating it every step of the way. And, and if you really look back and think of all the ways God has steered the course of your life, I, I, hope, it, I hope it sends chills up your spine. Uh, I hope you can just marvel at it and just stand there and just, just hang your head and say, thank you, God, uh, for giving me what you've given me and directing the course of my life. So God has your reins. He wants to lead you if you'll let him. He doesn't want to have to force you. He could if he had to but he doesn't want to. He wants to lead you to good things. And, and if you're wise, if you're wise, you'll let him. All right? Uh, then it says, he placed us in our mother's womb. So God is the creator of all life. All life begins at conception uh, through the miracle of creation. Um, when the two portions uh, of DNA come together in a, in a woman's womb. Did you know under extreme magnification there is a flash of light? Uh, it can be recorded by medical science. That's the moment you begin to exist. And in that instant, you have a genetically unique, never again to be repeated, 100% unique human being. And there will never be another. That is why abortion is a despicable, evil abomination. It's murder. And we are killing the most innocent people among us. And we cannot expect that the judgment of God will sleep. Our land is drenched in the blood of innocence. And the judgment of God is coming. So I marvel at human life. Human life is sacred. Each and every child is a miracle of God, not an accidental byproduct of human reproduction. I was there at the birth of every single one of my kids so I could greet them and say, hello, welcome to the world. <laughs> they don't remember, but I did it every single time. And I, 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 I treated each child as a gift because that's what they were. And God gave me six. And uh, I have great treasure as a consequence. Human beings are the image bearers of God. And our bodies are a reflection of God's genius and his artistic ability. Look what it says. We are fearful and wonderful. You know, we're, we're not animals. Some people may act like animals but we're not animals. We live in two worlds. We are unique in all creation in that we have a body and we have a soul. Angels don't have that. They're just spirits. <laughs> animals have bodies, but they don't have souls. Dogs 
do not go to heaven. I don't care what the Disney Corporation says. That's nonsense. They have bodies. But we have a body and a soul. When Jesus Christ became a man, he took on flesh and dwelt among us. So there is that part of the Godhead that has a body exactly like we do, just without sin. And you keep your body forever. Did you know that? You might die and be separated from it briefly as you know, compared to eternity, but you're going to get it back. The resurrection is going to happen, and you're going to get the best version of yourself. You know, So it's the version of yourself that can't get sick and doesn't feel pain and you know, can't be injured. Uh, um, I think we can probably travel places instantaneously like Jesus does, although that might be uh, an aspect of his omnipresence and so maybe not but I'm certain we can go places fast angels can do it um, you know we're not I, I'm going to stand on the surface of the sun someday just because I can you know I'm going to go to the moon I want to see the rings of Saturn you know I got places to go and things to see before God destroys this heaven and earth and makes another one and I'm going to have the immortal body that'll make that possible you need a body like that because otherwise if you stood in the presence of God you would be consumed in a moment. So you're going to get a new body and it's going to be a perfect body and you're going to get a new name that only God knows. You're going to get clean white raiments that never need to be washed. All the ladies are like glory hallelujah never have to do laundry again. <laughs> and I assume at the marriage feast of the lamb you can have all the fried chicken, greasy foods, and, and cheesecake you want and suffer no, no physical consequences. My wife will be in the line that forms over at the bread aisle with all the other gluten intolerant people, just horking down bread as fast as she can eat it. Uh, and when I would tell my sons this, you know the first thing you do when Jesus comes for us is we go immediately to a feast, right? Their eyes would get big, you know? And they would kind of, you know, they're, they're, and glisten, you know, with that greed and hunger that only a teenage boy has, right? <laughs> like, what do you think we'll have to eat? Whatever you like. As much as we want. Yeah, as much as you want. Seconds, thirds, twelfths, I don't know. what. How, how much food can an immortal stomach hold? <laughs> Find out. <laughs> so, our bodies are marvelous. You know, you are a work of God's artistic en engineering genius. You're like the Sistine Chapel. You know, you're, you're like a painting that hangs in a gallery somewhere. Um, and everything about us is designed to inspire awe and reverence. You know, that's why we generally in the West don't burn our bodies. We bury them <laughs> out of respect because we're aware that that's, that's the temple of God. Now, if you know somebody that's had cremation, that's, that's totally fine. I always joke with my family that I want a Viking funeral, you know, where they launch me in a longboat and then launch flaming arrows out there, you know, that kind of thing. But um, the point is, the human body is a, is a marvelous thing. Uh, and each and every human being is magnificent, unique, and beautiful. So no matter what you may think of yourself, the Bible says it, and, and it is authoritative, and you can't argue with it unless you're prepared to argue with God. You are wonderful. You are. You are marvelous. Never forget that. And don't let anybody ever run you down. You are the image bearer of Almighty God. And that is a remarkable thing. So, uh, verse 15, uh, God creates us in the womb. And our substance was not hid from thee when we were made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. And it's, it's talking about human reproduction. We're, we're like a clock. You know, when as soon as God pulls the trigger on a new human life, you know, and that, that, that new zygote is formed, you know, you got your 23 chromosomes and then your other 23 chromosomes and they come together and you get a unique human being. God starts building that body piece by piece and bit by bit. And it forms around the soul that now inhabits it until it reaches the place where it can survive outside the womb. So you're like a clock, uh, not uh, the digital variety, but the old-fashioned kind with little teeny gears and things, uh, which you can still buy them, and they're still just ex as expensive as, as they've ever been because very few people still know how to make those things, and they are uh, marvelous pieces of engineering. So the process of growth for an unborn child is efficient 
and incredibly complex. And then verse 16 tells us that, you know, thine eyes did see my substance, yet being imperfect. You know, God sees us and is with us in the womb. Uh, when they began to advance uh, the arguments for why abortion should be allowed back in the 70s, it was before we had ultrasound technology. Uh, they've got, it, it's practically in full color now. Uh, it, is, it is so detailed, you can see everything. You can see the features of their face. You know, you, you can see their little personalities. Uh, you know, we started off, you know, I always told God I wanted, you know, I got nothing against girls, but I want my firstborn to be a son. Give me a son. And God was gracious. He gave me two for the price of one. And it was, it was a, a wonderful deal. Uh, I joke and tell everybody, you know, I do my cloning the old-fashioned way. Uh, but that's, that's, that's literally what they are. They're, they're genetic clones of each other. But they're so unique. And you could watch them scuffling in the womb. Now, imagine the violence of little boys wrestling inside your body. All right? That's what was happening with her. And you could see it from the outside. <laughs> and we would go, and go to the ultrasounds. And John always had to have a hand on James or a foot all the time. Uh, he was that way after he was born. Uh, we could barely separate them. And when they got old enough, I said, now, children, you know, sons, you need to sleep in separate beds. You know, that was a sad day in the Huckabee Owls. And I'm like, now, you understand, someday your son, your brother's going to grow up and get married, and he's going to have a wife, and you will not be able to sleep with him. <laughs> and he just looked at me like I was crazy. Like, what do you mean I'm not going to be able to sleep with him? <laughs> I think they understand the realities of that uh, now. But, you know, we would, we would be looking at them, and James would kind of pull himself over into the front because he's always been, you know, Mr. Brash and out there, and then John would just go, pow, right in the face. And then they would go, <laughs> You can see their tiny little personalities, even in the womb. It's amazing. It's the coolest thing I've ever seen. Um, I don't understand how anybody could want to kill something like that. Not once you've seen it. Uh, it it's just remarkable. So our, our bodies are incomplete at first, and it's like a house that's being constructed from the foundation up. And each new stage of growth is designed to bring us closer, step by step, to being out, able to live outside the womb. And, of course, that is the end goal, which is to be born. Uh, did you know babies decide when they want to be born? They trigger something chemically in the woman's body that starts the whole labor process. Uh, my son Ethan was a late sleeper. Uh, we had to give him chemical eviction because uh, we decided that, son, you had to live on the outside of your mother's body. You just can't be in there forever. And, and he was 10 pounds, 6 ounces. He was a, a gigantic baby. And he is 6 foot 8 now. <laughs> So he is a big, big boy. All right. Uh, it says, all our members were written. God has a blueprint, an exact design for each of us. Uh, eyes, hair, skin, height, temperament, personality, intelligence. God designed all of them. All of them. You are the you that you are because God made you to be that way. All right. And so if you're ornery, you're probably looking at everybody and saying, see there, you know, I'm just fulfilling my design. So maybe don't go that far. But the point is, you, know, you are the you that you are. And, and I'll say it, uh, and it's probably a hate crime, but you know, come and get me. Uh, God makes you male, or he makes you female. And that is who you are. And no surgery and no drugs can possibly change that. So be who God made you to be. So God knows us because he expertly crafted us and was with us in the womb every step of the way. So we serve a God who knows everything about us. You know, he sees everything we do. He hears everything we think. He hears everything we say. He's with us everywhere we go. We serve a God who's intensely interested in everything we do. Uh, don't ever feel like your life is an accident. You, know, you, you were put here for a purpose, and it's your job and your duty to find out what that is. And, and if you're curious, well, ask the one who made you, because he knows. 
and he'll make sure you find out. Uh, we serve a God who's with us. Everywhere we go, he is there. And we serve a God who fashioned us with skill and artistry. He was with us from the beginning and every step of our lives. And he'll be waiting for us there at the end. And I hope you have taken the time to get to know the God who made you. The God who loves you. The God who was willing to become a man and live among sinful people and be taken by false accusation and executed by Romans in the worst way you could ever execute a criminal through crucifixion and perish in terrible pain and agony and pour out his blood as a sacrifice for your sins. I hope you know that, Savior. And if you don't, let today be the day of your salvation because once you get reborn, and that's what the verse means, rebirth, it's like being born again <laughs> and made totally new and all the old things pass away and everything becomes new. You can become a follower of Jesus Christ and finally know the God who's known you all of your life and has perhaps delivered you to such a time as this so you could hear the gospel and finally know him the way he knows you. I hope you know that, God. So let's uh, bow our head and close our eyes. And I want to give you an opportunity to respond as the Holy Spirit is dealing with you tonight. Uh, and I, as I tell everybody in Uganda, I'm aware that every time I preach, I'm speaking to two groups of people. And there really are only two groups, two groups that matter. Uh, those that are lost because they do not know Christ, and those who have been saved through faith in Jesus Christ. And you are in one of those two groups. So if you're here tonight and you say, I, I, I don't think I know God. I don't think I've never believed on Jesus to save me from my sins, but I, I would like to for the first time. If that is your need tonight, would you just raise your hand right up and put it right back down again? I don't know God, but I want to. Child of God, I don't know what kind of a life you've lived, and I don't know what kind of people you've been around, and I don't know what they've been telling you. But if you've never had it said to you before, let me say to you, you are beautiful and wonderful and marvelous. And God loves you, and he cares about you. And every time in your life it's been the darkest, he was there. Every time you've suffered, he's been with you. And he's still with you. So are there any Christians here tonight that would say, God, I want to know you like you know me. Help me to know you and to follow you. If that's your prayer tonight, would you raise your hand? And I, I raise my hand with you. Lord, help me to know you and to follow you. All right, you can put your hands down. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for being the God that you are, this magnificent monarch that <laughs> rules everything and yet calls us your children and treats us that way. And I thank you, God, that you know us and you care about us. And I pray, God, that if there's anybody here tonight that's struggling with that knowledge that feels lost or ignored or unloved that they would come to you and get the love and care that you offer and i pray god that we would seek all of our life to know you better and to walk with you every day and i pray all these things in jesus name amen god bless you